So it's now my pleasure to introduce a, an old friend of mine. Um, not that she's old, just that we've been friends for a long time. Um, we were thrilled in London after, after we lost uh, Dr. Barry DeWeber, our pediatric hematologist and co-medical um, director of our, of our clinics there, that Dr. Martin Inwood was able to uh, recruit Dr. Patricia McCusker to come to London because we needed her and we wanted her. And when she got there, um, she was everything that we hoped for. And it was wonderful um, to have her there. The other good news for me was that um, Patricia was a um, a nurse before she was a physician. So nurses need I say more. We were so lucky to get a physician who started her career in nursing. And so we were delighted with that. So she came to us in 94, working with Dr. Inwood in the Southwestern Ontario Hemophilia Program, providing uh, care for the boys under 18 years of age. And she took a care of the moms and the sisters and the dads too, I will add, add that. Um, she then moved on to the University of Manitoba, where she's working with them, and, and uh, their gain was certainly our loss. Uh, she's also been involved with the HCDC and CHS. Most recently, she has been the chair of the CHS committee reviewing grant proposals for Carental Cure, as well as Dream of a Cure, as well as studentship and fellowship applications. Thank you. Um, we've got a busy afternoon, so I'm just going to uh, get right, in, right into it. The first speaker uh, we heard earlier uh, this morning, Dr. Kuis, am I saying that wrong? Could it? I, it is not okay. Um, who's going to be discussing uh, the uh, uh, role of um, registration and surveillance in uh, uh, systems in the U.S. for uh, patients with bleeding disorders. Uh, so without further ado. Uh, thank you very much. It, you know, the way you pronounce my name reminds me of earlier today, uh, uh, Rochelle was saying when she introduced her uh, colleague who was her teacher that she was the funniest teacher in OBGYN. In my experience in medical school, it was by accident that the OBGYN teacher became the funniest person in our class because of the fact that in our second year, this professor was giving the lecture on human reproductive function. And he kept saying, and he was going over as an hour lecture on the physiological variables uh, that occur during sexual intercourse. And he kept referring to sexual intercourse as quitus. So he said, during, <laughs> during quitus interruptus, and, this is a class of 200 people, and everybody's laughing like this. I'm in the back turning red. I have my hoodie on that I'm pulling over. And, and, and he became more upset, and it got worse, because that, how could you be laughing? Because in, in, in three months, you're going to be talking to patients face to face. They're going to have concerns about quitus. <laughs> so, so it could have been worse, so thank you. And then a few years later, I was in the emergency room as a, uh, it gets worse, I mean, as a resident, and uh, a nurse comes up to me, and this is the custom when someone has acute chest pain, they'll immediately shove the EKG in front of your face. She says, I'm really concerned about this patient. Look at the EKG. I looked at it, I started laughing. She says, what could be funny with this EKG? And I said, look who you spelled as a referring uh, physician, Dr. C-O-I-T-U-S. <laughs> so, and then I didn't hear from it, you know, the following week, my friends in cardiology reading the EKGs are paging me laughing about this. <laughs> so anyway, um, another uh, person uh, uh, who I'm going to uh, share a credit of this presentation, she has an easier name, uh, called Carney. My uh, dear colleague, Rashi, has worked with me over the years uh, on uh, a uh, surveillance system that we've tried to set up in the United States. And we hope there is a parallel um, uh, opportunity to uh, uh, harmonized data that uh, you're collecting here in uh, Canada and elsewhere. So we thought we'd kind of give an update on that. And then at the end, I just have a quick uh, wish list of some of the research areas that are perhaps could be done, you know, internationally uh, in that uh, regard. And uh, some of these slides are from my colleague Roshni that are somewhat uh, explanatory, kind of preaching to the choir here. So I'm not going to spend uh, that much time. And in terms of, you know, what is the purpose of, you know, a registry? 
Um, you know, it has a number of opportunities, and uh, in many ways, uh, you've become leaders for us in the hemophilia world, uh, the way you've collected uh, data uh, in that uh, regard. And certainly, uh, when we talk about registries and surveillance, uh, there's definitely, you know, a uh, purpose and a benefit in uh, doing that as we, um, you know, uh, go along, um, you know, in, in such a uh, project. And uh, the way we collect data, obviously, can be done in different ways um, in terms of surveillance. And uh, we can, you know, talk about, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, clinical uh, surveillance with uh, syndromes or uh, laboratory monitoring of a population of diabetics per se, uh, for example, for hemoglobin A1C. Um, and also uh, our pharmaceutical colleagues often have mandates in terms of post-marketing uh, surveillance, too. And there's many different ways we can uh, go about doing this, of course, and uh, that would uh, include, obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, surveys that are uh, at the user, end, at the patient end, or at our end, uh, you know, in that uh, regard. And uh, obviously, there's many data points, you know, that can be uh, uh, collected. And in collecting these data points, uh, you know, we can certainly uh, be talking, you know, we can um, certainly it allows us to get a sense of, you know, the magnitude of the problem in, you know, that regard. And as a starting point for bleeding disorders research, obviously our model is in uh, hemophilia. And um, again, uh, you know, there are some just basics that we all are aware of that we need uh, to uh, collect. Um, and then again, there are problems in terms of collecting such, you know, uh, basics in terms of the fact that, especially with von Willebrands, you can have a variable presentation. And um, we're very lucky uh, through the efforts and uh, part of uh, Paul and David uh, and their work with uh, refining the bleeding score that this has helped us. And in our surveillance uh, presently, we have incorporated uh, these uh, definitions. Uh, in that regard. And this is a nice global view of what, you know, has been accomplished, uh, you know, internationally in terms of surveillance as a starting point, you know, patients with, uh, with hemophilia, but it is applicable uh, to uh, women with bleeding disorders uh, to a certain degree, though these uh, uh, programs have been primarily, you know, for males with uh, severe hemophilia. And, um, is a part of that in the United States. Uh, this is an effort uh, that now is uh, really uh, uh, into its uh, third uh, decade and um, uh, really has uh, been able to uh, um, continue because of uh, continued uh, funding uh, from uh, the government, which unfortunately in this day and age uh, is in continued jeopardy. Every uh, congressional cycle, there's another uh, budget uh, cut uh, uh, in that uh, sense. So. Um, but, but there has been a program uh, that has been funded in terms of surveillance of our uh, children with uh, severe hemophilia. And a lot of this started uh, through the efforts of uh, Peter Levine at the University of Massachusetts. And the first step was a big white arrow where they funded, uh, where this project was funded uh, among um, over uh, 60 hemophilia treatment centers. And now there's a network of uh, 128 hemophilia treatment centers that is carrying out surveillance that is kind of reinventing itself in terms of the American Thrombosis Hemostasis Network, Athen, um, is really uh, the repository now for this uh, information where we were collecting data on our severe hemophiliacs uh, in terms of uh, their range of motion, their presentation, and uh, this was uh, termed the universal data collection sheet, and this also included other patients with rare bleeding disorders uh, such as factor 11 uh, deficiency that would also include women and women with moderate to severe von Willebrands. So there is, uh, there, there's some, you know, uh, there was a starting point that we collected some data on women and then we were able over the years to refine it further. One refinement also was to have a specific data collection for babies and then we were able to receive funding and support since 2006 to develop a surveillance program for uh, uh, specifically for women with uh, bleeding disorders, and uh, that's what we have presently. We call that the female universal data collection uh, study. And uh, again, a lot of this was through the efforts of uh, Roshan Kulkarni, who was then acting director of the hematologic branch of the Centers for Disease Control back um, in the mid-2000s. 
And uh, we really felt, as you do here today uh, with that second bullet, there's a lot of um, questions that are still unanswered and there's need to, you know, uh, collect uh, such data in that sense. And this is a variation of the slide that uh, Rochelle uh, showed this morning uh, where we were compelled in part by the sheer numbers of uh, more and more patients uh, being registered. And it really sounds like you have a parallel rise over these years of uh, patients, you know, with uh, bleeding disorders. And um, presently, uh, as we're, you know, coming up with this data, obviously, uh, the majority of these patients, you know, uh, will have uh, von Willebrand's, but there's other diagnoses that we thought was very important uh, to uh, collect uh, because uh, often, you know, these patients, um, you know, are just relegated to case reports in the literature, and uh, it's uh, still uh, going to be helpful to try to compile as much information as possible with these very rare conditions, uh, for example, like prothrombin uh, deficiency, factor II deficiency. And this is the breakdown in our, uh, our present uh, surveillance of uh, these, uh, of these uh, patients who were initially in, this was in the general universal data collection uh, form, uh, that we did of, uh, that also uh, was uh, included patients with, um, um, with included males with hemophilia too. Um, so what we had decided to do was to set up this specific female universal data collection form uh, because for females uh, in that uh, regard. So this group was uh, convened in the mid uh, uh, 2000s and uh, the first step with any uh, registered data collection form surveillance is to really pilot your forms. And this was very helpful because in doing that, where we uh, uh, had by consensus developed uh, uh, data collection forms, we wanted uh, to obviously make sure that they were user friendly both end of the uh, staff uh, uh, colleague who was administering it to the patient and then from the end of the, uh, from the uh, patient's perspective too. So we did get uh, uh, feedback that helped us fine tune this and uh, we were then able to uh, make some modifications. And then about three years ago, we were able to implement, implement our surveillance um, where we chose nationally uh, to pick two hemophilia treatment centers from each region to start small and then to expand uh, in that regard. And the data that we have to date is uh, based on uh, 316 patients that uh, were, um, that was published uh, as initial analysis uh, by uh, my colleague Vanessa Byams. And um, the, uh, we're now up to about 550 uh, patients. And uh, again, you can see uh, this is a uh, somewhat medium age cohort, uh, somewhat younger is a little bit surprising as we were talking about data from our own uh, CDC that has shown that, you know, on average there's a 16 year delay in diagnosis. The average age in our patients is in the mid uh, 20s. And you can see also uh, the, the breakdown and that a number of these patients, um, you know, uh, did have a family uh, history. And um, uh, certainly, you know, we see, uh, uh, you can see the age distribution in terms of the uh, age of diagnosis is kind of curious. It's a number of them were, were diagnosed uh, earlier than what we would have thought. And they may be partly uh, thanks to efforts uh, around the world to try to identify patients uh, sooner. And um, even though uh, von Wilbrand's is the most common, uh, we're trying to uh, get at these other bleeding disorders, as you can see uh, listed here. Uh, in that uh, regard. And this is somewhat a variation of the uh, uh, bleeding um, uh, survey where we try to define some of these symptoms uh, with a similar parallel uh, score um, that uh, we did in asking these questions about other mucocutaneous uh, bleeding symptoms. And remember, we're not only looking at women with von Willebrand's, but other bleeding disorders. So uh, we have had patients uh, report uh, joint symptoms. And um, uh, preliminarily what we're finding very interesting is that um, the uh, standard hemostatic therapies that we feel is within our, our uh, bailiwick, within our tool shed as a hematologist, are really underutilized. And part of that could be that it's only been a year and a half that we have available in the United States tranexamic acid. Um, so that probably explains in part uh, why there is a lower use of uh, cyclocapron than what we, you would see in other places like here or in, uh, uh, in Europe, particularly Northern Europe, you know you can walk in a pharmacy and just obtain transamic acid in Sweden. 
um, in that uh, regard. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, it also is a reminder that, you know, oral contraceptive uh, has the additional benefit, of course, uh, uh, besides, you know, perhaps uh, control of the heavy menses. Uh, and uh, certainly we see that as a, you know, uh, that probably explains why it's, you know, the, the uh, leading, you know, uh, uh, treatment choice for heavy menstrual bleeding uh, in that regard. And uh, as we continue to uh, carry out surveillance of these patients, we anticipate we'll see more use of the levonorgestrel IUD uh, because of the fact that, uh, at least in the States, um, uh, you know, initially there was uh, hesitance to use it, particularly in the younger population. Uh, again, not to... Uh, uh, sound that uh, we live in fear of uh, the legal system, but uh, unfortunately, in part, uh, Burlex, who uh, first had uh, this uh, uh, this uh, drug, and I believe Bayer now uh, markets it. Uh, Burlex was marketing it as, con as uh, contraception for uh, for mothers because they were afraid that if uh, you know they weren't emphasizing that it should be for mothers on this probably false assumption that mothers may not be in situations where the significant other may you know be unfaithful and could pass an STD but they were afraid of the risk of STD uh, in people uh, who you know have a partner who's in other sexual relationships and then uh, the you know worrying about being sued uh, in terms of you know infertility um, but uh, certainly, you know, there's a role for it, and also in the adolescent population, at least also initially in the United States, uh, they were worried not only that the adolescents could be at a higher risk of STDs and then the risk for infertility, uh, there was concerns about trying to uh, uh, insert it in such a patient, though. It's, you know, that's really just a, uh, you know, uh, learning curve, and there's very good uh, colleagues in the GYN field who are very comfortable uh, placing it in the liparous uh, young uh, female in that uh, regard. So we anticipate as we do further follow-up, we'll see more use of the IUD because I really agree from what Dr. Perker said that uh, there is, uh, the, the data for that is uh, very encouraging. And uh, we also notice other issues along the lines of uh, what uh, Rochelle uh, referred to earlier about other, um, you know, issues hand-in-hand, uh, uh, hand, obviously, dysmenorrhea is going to be an issue uh, in this uh, population. And we're also collecting data on pregnancy. It's still a little bit early to really have a sense whether there's a significant increase in the miscarriage rate. The study I mentioned by DeWeese from the Dutch that was just published last year in uh, uh, thrombosis hemostasis of uh, their experience about 300 women with type 2 and type 3 von Willebrands, they um, uh, reported uh, a miscarriage rate about 15 to, I think, 17 percent. And it was slightly above the control, their uh, control rate uh, in uh, Holland, but it's not clear if it's statistically significant in that sense. And my last slide is just really a wish list of, of well, actually, my next last slide is, um, you know, the fact that, um, you know, it's important that we continue to sustain this effort and that uh, both here and abroad uh, uh, in Europe and uh, in Asia that there are uh, registries set up specifically to look at uh, women uh, and trying to, uh, um, you know, uh, be able to have the data for future planning in terms of uh, resource uh, utilization and uh, allocation uh, in that sense. And finally, my last slide is just to um, really uh, mention that, you know, this is just one part of looking at it from the epidemiological end, uh, and there's a number of ongoing studies. I know there's many more. These are just ones that I'm somewhat uh, uh, personally involved with. I mentioned uh, in my talk on postpartum hemorrhage uh, that uh, we've just completed a uh, case control study. And uh, in this session, Dr. Demers will be talking about uh, the, the considerable work they've done in Canada uh, in that regard. So I didn't include that, but I know there's been an effort here in Canada looking at uh, uh, what happens to the levels and its, the implications as they fall in the postpartum uh, period uh, in that uh, regard. And uh, our colleague, uh, Rosanna Kadir, um, uh, does have, through the International Society of Thrombosis Stasis, a registry for levonorgestrel use. And I would encourage you to do that because uh, in follow-up of their initial uh, study uh, uh, authored by Kingman, 
uh, with uh, Professor Kadir, they showed that um, you know it was very effective. And since then, in a follow-up uh, study, they've shown that some you know it, it's even effective beyond five years. Though uh, the shelf life of it is supposed to be about uh, five years. But it's so important to collect that data. There are some uh, concerns, at least in our own experience, of uh, continued spotting for uh, three to six months uh, in that uh, regard. And then Flora Pivandi has a very similar surveillance uh, uh, template that she's using uh, in Europe. And we would love to work with you about uh, you know, harmonizing our data with a template that you are perhaps using now or could use uh, in Canada because there'll be you know, power in numbers uh, in that uh, sense. And Paul is aware that there is a group with a women's uh, hemostasis um, subgroup of ICH that would like to hopefully implement a uh, Mensi specific uh, bleeding score uh, in that uh, regard. And we're all very interested because we all work closely with CSL bearing um, uh, with their other products such as HumAP and um, uh, also uh, intranasal DDAP to uh, perhaps uh, receive support to uh, use the fibrinogen concentrate in uh, women, not necessarily with um, von Willebrand's, but with severe postpartum uh, uh, hemorrhage, uh, you know, in that uh, regard. So I think, you know, there's a lot of other opportunities. And, and uh, finally, one last area that I think really deserves further, you know, interest and energy uh, is in adolescence. And, uh, uh, there is that conundrum that often in adolescence, uh, at the onset of menses, the, the menses could be heavy, but they're also quite irregular. And uh, so when you have anovulatory heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, it's not clear to what degree the uh, hemostatic defect is contributing to this, as opposed to the fact is it primarily hormonal based. So I think there's really a need for further studies. Uh, we have a colleague, Lakshmi Venktation, at University of Texas, who's going to be specifically look, using our uh, surveillance uh, tools uh, to delve into that further in uh, U.S. Uh, uh, patients uh, with adolescent uh, menses. And we're particularly interested to look at that interaction between the inovatory uh, uh, nature of it and the, uh, the heavy menses uh, in that uh, regard. And then in terms of quality of life, it's, I think, uh, natural to ask a question, and it's hard to really develop the best study to do this, but, um, you know, again, it's mentioned about quality of life, especially in adolescence. Well, what about specifically about quality of life in adolescence in terms of the fact was mentioned that it could affect cognitive impairment? Well, it turns out in the pediatric literature, there's a lot of literature that iron deficiency uh, lead, can lead to decreased uh, um, math uh, scores, uh, uh, in particular. So uh, to what degree it has that impact, I think, uh, you know, deserves uh, further study in that regard. Thank you. So we have time for some questions, if there's any. No one has any questions? I think it was all downhill after the joke about my name. So. <laughs> well, oh, you don't get off that easy. <laughs> they may not have a question, but I, I have one question for you. Yes. Surveillance um, data is actually very important, and I agree completely. But how do you make sure that you're reaching the population that you're interested in? How do you ensure that, that the data that you're collecting is uh, ap applicable to the to the population that you're interested in? That's a great question because, you know, that is always a criticism of prevalent studies that it's a moving target, is that especially in the bleeding disorder field, uh, you know, it may not be very representative when you're looking at your population in the hemophilia treatment center where there is, you know, you're selecting out perhaps mm -hmm. the most symptomatic uh, patients. So one way to try to get around this is, is that um, uh, presently the CDC is also uh, uh, supporting uh, studies to look at trying to, uh, through various uh, healthcare agencies, trying to look at patients who are outside of hemophilia treatment centers and serving them for, you know, bleeding disorders in that regard. But you're right, it's a, that is a concern and a challenge and a criticism, you know, with these types of studies. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you again. And in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, move on to, the, to our next speaker. Christine Demers is, is uh, going to be talking to us um, about um, 
pregnancy and the changes in coagulation factors. Christine comes for, to us, um, she's a clinic director uh, in Quebec City. She uh, has been doing research in this area for a good length of time, and she's uh, been actively involved in the uh, uh, women in bleeding disorders uh, for since its inception, and she's the past uh, uh, chair of that, that division. So without further ado, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this study started a few years ago um, by the Subcommittee of, on Women with Bleeding Disorders of DHCDC. At that time, we were working on guidelines on the management of pregnancy and realized that there was very few data on the coagulation factor during pregnancy and in the postpartum. Let me start with two clinical cases to illustrate how the lack of data can influence our clinical management. The first case is a 27-year-old pregnant woman. Uh, she has a diagnosis of mild uh, von Willebrand disease 12 years ago, but we have no factual levels available. And the question is, can we determine uh, or if she has von Willebrand disease now that she's pregnant? The second case is a type 1 von Willebrand disease with baseline level between 0.28 and 0.35. She's uh, at 35 weeks pregnant, she had uh, levels that were measured and they were normal. She's now discharged home three days after a non-complicated vaginal delivery. And the question is, what are the recommendations for the postpartum uh, follow-up to her physician? So in order to answer this question, it would be useful to know what are the coagulation factors to expect during pregnancy and in the postpartum. So what do we know about that? In healthy women, we know that both the factor VIII and the von Willebrand rise significantly throughout pregnancy. In the beginning, the von Willebrand antigen and the factor VIII rise together, but with time, the von Willebrand antigen increase more, so at the end of the pregnancy, it is generally higher than the factor VIII. And the postpartum level return to normal somewhere between weeks two and eight. In women with bleeding disorders, there are several case series, most of them with a small numbers of patients. A lot of these data were presented this morning, so I'll go through them very quickly. First of all, in type 1 von Willebrand disease, there's usually a progressive increase in both the factor VIII and the von Willebrand level, with a peak in the third trimester. There, however, if the factor level is below 0.15, there is very little increase. Not surprisingly, in type 3, there's usually no increase in the factor level. In type 2 von Willebrand disease, there's an increase in the factor 8 and in the von Willebrand antigen, but usually no increase in the activity. In hemophilia carriers A, the factor 8 usually increases during pregnancy and is uh, usually normal at delivery. And the factor uh, 9 carriers of hemophilia B there's generally no change in the factor level during pregnancy. Now look at the, looks, uh, let's look at the data in the postpartum. There's very few data on the factor level on the postpartum. We know uh, that there's an increased risk of uh, postpartum hemorrhage, both primary and secondary, with a risk uh, uh, as high as 20 to 30 percent in some publication. The risk of postpartum hemorrhage is higher if the factor level is below 0.5, and the average uh, for the postpartum hemorrhage is generally around day 15, plus or minus five days. There is also an increased risk of perineal hematoma described in women with bleeding disorders. So the objective of our study uh, is to assess pros prospectively the laboratory and clinical evolution of von Willebrand disease and hemophilia carriers in pregnancy and in the postpartum period and compare the result to control women. And secondly, to evaluate the utility of a modified pictorial blood assessment chart called the PBAC in the diagnosis of postpartum hemorrhage. So our population uh, include pregnant women with von Willebrand disease defined as at least two out of three tests below 0.5, so either the antigen, the activity, or the factor VIII, or carriers of hemophilia A and B defined as factor VIII or IX below 0.5, or 
or in an established genetic mutation associated with hemophilia. Three centers in Canada participate, Quebec City, Montreal, and Kingston. The control were consecutive pregnant women seen in the first trimester of pregnancy at the obstetric department of two hospitals in Quebec City. This is the laboratory that was done. So uh, patients were tested on week 15, week 28, and between week 32 and 38 weeks in the pregnancy, and in postpartum on day 1, 2, 4, 7, and 28. Hemoglobin, platelet, and ferritin were, were, were performed, as well as the von Willebrand testing. And the baseline, le the baseline, le baseline levels for the patient were taken from the chart at the time they were diagnosed for, uh, with their disease. So the guidelines for, for delivery was as follows. So factor levels of 0.5 or above were, were considered adequate and no specific treatment suggested. If the factor level was below 0.5, treatment was considered. There was a close follow-up of postpartum bleeding, and if possible, no oral contraceptive or iron therapy given after delivery. Clinical information was gathered in on medication, bleeding, or other complications during pregnancy, on the mode of delivery, gestational age, postpartum blood loss, and treatment during delivery, and on the use of oral contraceptive and iron, uh, and the, the breastfeeding and postpartum. We uh, use a uh, modified uh, PBAC score. Um, sorry for the picture, I was fine on my computer, I don't know what's happening. Um, so we use a modified PBAC score that was adapted from the original publication um, for menorrhagia. So for four weeks, women were asked to uh, fill this chart we provide them with two types of pad, a heavy absorption pad and a light absorption pad. And um, we uh, tested the pad, the absorption of each pad, and attribute a score of 3, 6, and 15 for the heavy absorption pad, depending if it was lightly, moderately, or heavily soaked. And the corresponding figure for the light absorption pad was 1, 2, and 8. Of course, this is an arbitrary score, uh, and uh, we did the, the measure with different score, and the result I'm going to show you uh, were not different. So our pop patient population includes 60 women with VWD, 515 were type 1, and one was type 2, B. There were five hemophilia carriers uh, of A. There was no uh, hemophilia B carriers. We had 20 controls, but only uh, complete result on 17 of them. This is the baseline characteristic of the patient. Uh, age was the same. Most of the women deliver after 37 weeks. 88% of the control at a vaginal delivery compared to 60, 57 of the, uh, the patient. Only one patient uh, used oral contraceptive. 93% of the control were breastfeeding compared to 68% of the patient. And there was no postpartum hemorrhage, uh, either primary or secondary. And there was no uh, perineal hematoma. Uh, we had this, some difficulty of having the blood loss at the time of delivery. A lot of patients, it was just uh, written that it was normal or uh, below 500 cc's. So it was difficult to have the exact amount of blood that was uh, lost at the time of delivery. So on this slide, you can see the mean factor level in type 1 uh, von Willebrand. It's the printer. Anyway. Um, so uh, you can see here on the... Um, this I see? Okay. okay. Uh, so here you can see the baseline level uh, for the factor A, the von Willebrand antigen and the activity. Again, I'm very sorry, it was really fine on the, on the computer. Uh, so you have the mean uh, level and you have the range in, in the bracket. As you can see, uh, the, all of our patients had mild von Willebrand disease with the lowest value being 0.28. So the uh, there was an increase in the factor, uh, the antigen, the activity, and the factor eight, which was parallel during pregnancy, but in the postpartum, the factor eight level was higher. Uh, 
On this slide, you can see the individual result uh, for the patient with type 1 von Willebrand disease. Let's concentrate on pregnancy uh, only for now. As, and we're going to consider the normal testing being all three tests above 0.5. So 80% of our women had normal values at 15 weeks and 100% at week 28, as you can see here, meaning all three values above, above 0.5. So the, uh, we can conclude come for that, that if we screen for von Willebrand disease in early pregnancy, it's not likely to be useful because the levels were already normal. And after uh, 28 weeks, you can see that the factor level continue to increase until term. So the factor level should be measured uh, at least in the third trimester to make the recommendation for the delivery. The other thing we can see from this graph is once the coagulation profile normalized, it does not drop after, which means that if you have a patient with a normal value early during the pregnancy, and this patient comes with an emergency uh, intervention required, it is likely that the factor level is going to be the same or higher. On this uh, slide, you can see the postpartum result. Uh, once again, we're talking about uh, normal if all three, three tests are normal. So, as you can see, no decrease in factor level was observed, was observed be before day four. And by day seven, 90% of the patients still have normal values. And then on day 28, 50% of the women still have normal values. 62% of the women were breastfeeding, but we couldn't see any difference in the level between those who were breastfeeding and those who were not. This is the level in the hemophilia carriers with the baseline level here. So during pregnancy, the factor is normalized in all women. In three women, it normalized early. In one woman, it was not until week 28. In the third woman, it was uh, uh, only at week uh, 32 that the factor was normal. In postpartum, there was no decrease in factor level observed before day four. And by day seven and 28, 80% of our patients, or four out of five, still have normal values. This is the result in our only patient with a type 2 von Willebrand. Uh, as you can see, the uh, level rise rapidly during pregnancy and were normal at term. They were high on day two, but drop on day seven. And unfortunately, in this patient, we didn't have any measure on day four. And as expected, uh, the platelet uh, count drop uh, on the on de delivery and increase after that. This is the mean factor level in controls and in von, Willer uh, and in von Willebrand disease. So in control, you can see that the change in uh, all three factors were the same as in von Willebrand disease patient. The increase in the von Willebrand antigen activity and factor is parallel. And what, in, what was described in the previous paper that uh, at the end of the, the pregnancy, the antigen is higher than the factor eight was not observed in our cohort. This is the uh, uh, iron deficiency uh, table. So uh, we define iron deficiency as being a ferritin below 12 or hemoglobin below 120 on the uh, 28 postpartum. As you can see, five patients, so 24% of the patient, uh, had uh, iron deficiency uh, at one month postpartum, and also four controls had iron deficiency at, at the same timing. This is the PBAC in controls and patient. So in green, you can see the, the controls. Um, so the median score was 250. And you can see that there is a quite uniform score, score among all of the controls. In pink, you have the patient. The medium score is still 250. But here you have a wide distribution of score with some women being as low as 25 and other being as high as 1,000. Now, if you compare the score with the uh, iron deficiency, the arrows are the patient who have a low ferritin, and the star are those who have low hemoglobin. You can see that there is not a very good correlation between the score 
and the iron deficiency. Two patients were anemic had very high score, but we have also patients with very low score who were anemic. So the PVAC uh, was not a very good tool to predict iron deficiency in these patients. Of course, there could be other issue in the iron deficiency, such as the blood loss that was uh, at the time of delivery. And as I mentioned, it was difficult to know exactly the amount that was lost. So in conclusion, the von Willebrand profile in pregnant uh, von Willebrand disease patient follow a similar pattern as control. In type 1 von Willebrand disease, coagulation levels normalize early in pregnancy. Consequently, screening for von Willebrand disease in early pregnancy is unlikely to be useful. Factor levels should be measured at least in the third trimester. However, once the von Willebrand factor level normalized, it does not decline afterwards. In hemophilia A carriers, all women normalize their factor VIII level during pregnancy. In postpartum, factor level generally return to baseline after day seven. We were not able to demonstrate any effect of lactation on the postpartum factor levels. There was no postpartum hemorrhage in the study. Iron deficiency was frequent in patient and in control. The PBAC was not, was not a useful uh, tool to predict iron deficiency in the postpartum. This study has uh, several limitations. Uh, we had a small number of patients. All our patients, as I mentioned, sorry. All our patients, as I mentioned, were mild type 1. We had no patient with levels uh, below 0.28. Uh, so, of course, the results are not generalizable to patients with more severe type 1. We had no type 3 and only one patient with type 2. We had a poor assessment of the blood loss at delivery. And, of course, further studies are needed, and I'm uh, very interested in uh, looking at the result of the U.S. study. And to finish, I just want to come back to the two clinical cases that I presented at the beginning. So this uh, pregnant woman who is uh, 16 weeks pregnant uh, and had a diagnosis of von Willebrand uh, 12 years ago, the question was, can we uh, determine if she has von Willebrand disease uh, during pregnancy? So based on our result, uh, the factual level normalized early in pregnancy, so we can test her, but likely, it's likely that she's going to have normal result even at 16 weeks. The second uh, case was the woman who had uh, von Willebrand uh, disease. She has normal uh, factor uh, level at, uh, at uh, delivery, and she's now discharged home uh, after an uncomplicated vaginal delivery. The question was, what were the recommendations for the postpartum uh, follow-up. Uh, based on our result, we expect the factor to decrease after day seven, so this woman should be followed for excessive bleeding on week two, three, and four after a delivery. And given the high uh, level of iron deficiency in these patients, I would certainly recommend doing a hemoglobin and ferritin after one month. So I want to thank you for your attention, and I want to thank the Care Until Cure program uh, uh, that was um, CHS and Wyatt who funded this study. Thank you. Questions? Can, do you mind going to the mic? Um. I noticed that uh, Von Willebrand's patients, 63% were breastfeeding and control study was 93%. <clears throat> Is there any, do you have an answer as to possibly why that would be? No. Um, I don't know if any of the gynecologists would know. I don't know. Maybe because the cesarean section was uh, higher. Okay. So, okay. David? David? 
So, Christine, I, I noticed that in the, uh, the responses, there's a marked difference between individuals. Some women barely rise at all, and some have a, a three- or four-fold increase. So I'm wondering um, if there's any way of predicting that. So do, do, you, do you know whether the desmopressin responses predict a rise during pregnancy? I mean, it may well be a completely different mechanism, but is there any way you could predict who's going to be the people with the very good increases versus the sort of borderline increase? Uh, no, and uh, we don't have the DDAVP response for these patients. Most of them were mild and were not necessarily tested. So uh, I don't know, I have no way of predicting. Just to follow up on that question, would there be any way to uh, check these, these, this population now, those 16 patients? Yeah, sure. Because that it'd be a very interesting yeah. uh, addition. Um, you mean to test to do the DDAVP Just testing? to see if they to see what the DDAVP yeah. response was to see we, if there is a, yeah. a correlation. We might have the result from some of them. I, I had to, I had to check, but uh, I guess that most of them didn't have a DDAVP trial. But they're all our, most of them are our patients, so it would be easier to to do it. Yeah, sure. I noted that uh, both the controls and the patients, there was about a quarter of patients with iron deficiency, which yep. to me seems like that's like a national emergency if a quarter of women are iron deficient in pregnancy. No wonder nobody can, you know, mm. handle having newborns. Um, <laughs> but also, I'm a little surprised to see that the rates in your patients were the same because we've heard earlier today that iron deficiency is a significant problem in women with bleeding disorders. And I was wondering how you would begin to explain the fact that women without bleeding disorders yep. and women who are presumably entering, women with bleeding disorders who are presumably entering pregnancy, iron deficient. Yep have the same rates? I have no idea. But this was a surprise to me, too, to uh, find out that, uh, uh, in fact, three of these women were really had very low ferritin. Uh, one of the, the fourth one has an hemoglobin of 119, which is just above the, uh, below the, the, the cutoff of 120. Uh, so it might still be a normal value. So uh, there were, but at, at least there were three women who really had very low ferritin, and their level was like three or four in the normal. So I have no idea why. But it was a surprise to, uh, to me, too. Any other questions? Then uh, I'm going to say thank you again to Christine for that excellent presentation. And our next speaker is um, uh, Nisa uh, Renault, who is um, uh, was was working with um, in El, in Dalhousie doing her PhD when when uh, uh, um, she was awarded uh, she and a colleague were awarded funding from the CHS. She her interest in her PhD was looking at X chromosome inactivation uh, in um, in hemophilia carriers and. Uh, Following the completion of her PhD, she has moved to Paris, where she was working at the Pasteur Institute uh, in ge molecular genetics. And she returns today to tell us about um, the uh, 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 medical um, care experience of uh, hemophilia carriers. So, Nisa? Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me here. Thanks to Claire and the organizers for uh, inviting me to come talk about the work that we've done. And um, I'm speaking today on behalf of, uh, of the whole uh, research group. So um, myself and my former supervisor, Wenda Greer, and Sue Robinson and Robin Howell, we were all part of the, the project. Um, okay. So the project actually began at, at a conference like this, um, the uh, the All About Carriers Conference in Quebec, and uh, where I heard uh, stories from from the uh, women who'd had various experiences, and uh, felt that we really had to document these experiences formally, get them in the literature so that we could really understand what was going on in terms of the interaction between 
uh, carriers and the healthcare system. So the project was to document the experiences as well as discover themes that were um, running through the experiences and uh, define some terminology so that we can, we can talk accurately about what's going on. So uh, I interviewed uh, carriers as well as wanted to get the healthcare perspective. So talked with various healthcare professionals and, um, and after some preliminary interviews with the carriers themselves, we found that the, the nurse coordinators were really the ones that we needed to talk to, that carriers had the best, seemed to have the best relationship with them and they were the ones that really got to hear the stories um, so that's, uh, that's who I targeted for, for the healthcare side of things. And uh, I would encourage you to go see our, our paper. There's a lot more detail in there, especially if you have a chance to look at the supplemental information. There's a lot of quotations and stories that I wasn't able to fit in the paper, but they're really important. So if you get a chance, um, have a look at that. Um, okay, so um, the, we listened to of course, all the stories, but most of what we talked about were the negative experiences. Um, so that's a bias in the study, but I think it's, it's important because that's where we need to, to do some improving. Um, so the majority of, of experiences that we talked about were negative, and uh, the greatest number of, of negative experiences were coming from um, interactions with uh, hematologists, HTC teams, primary care physicians, and OBGYN. And I think that's probably, uh, they're also the most uh, positive experiences from those groups as well. So I think there's just more interactions in general. Um, the greatest discrepancy between positive and negative was in uh, surgery and dental. Okay, so um, we've talked a lot about symptoms today and of course focused on, on the sex limited. What's, what's different about the females are the, um, the gynecological and obstetrical issues. Uh, but I don't want to forget about the, the classic symptoms that uh, are, are apparent in, in carriers of hemophilia as well. So we noted, um, uh, or they discussed uh, prolonged nosebleeds and excessive post-operative or dental bleeding, easy bruising joint, be joint bleeds and chronic joint pain. So we subcategorized the negative care experiences um, into four categories. Uh, so carrier status, um, diagnosing whether or not they have bleeding disorder, management of the, the bleeding issues, um, and precautions, putting, putting things in place before an event happens. And I just wanted to emphasize here that uh, for carrier status, all of the non-obligate carriers that I, that I spoke with had a negative experience uh, getting their carrier testing. Um, and uh, all of the carriers that I spoke with had negative experiences involving precautions, so they didn't feel that things were put in place properly, whether they were gonna have a bleeding disorder or not, they wanted to feel that things were, were in place. Um, and then huge, huge was uh, just negative attitudes coming from healthcare providers. So uh, primarily dismissive attitudes. So we heard things like um, the doctors would tell them that it's all in their head, that they, they can't possibly have a bleeding disorder, that uh, no one will listen to them, no one believes them. Uh, doctors would tell them that they're just crazy, it just doesn't happen. Okay, so there's a lot of work still to be done there. Um, so we, we looked at what kinds of responses carriers had to these experiences. So we looked at both emotional and behavioral responses. And uh, for emotional responses, we found classic responses that are associated with um, errors in medical care. So um, we heard a little bit about this uh, this morning as well from the panel. So anger, obviously, um, doubting self or doubting their child. Do they really have something going on? They're complaining. Do I really believe them? Um, fear and anxiety, obviously, about their situation, disappointment, lost trust uh, and confidence in their care providers. Um, so, uh, so one carrier had, had so, much, um, so many difficulties with her doctors that she just didn't have any respect for them anymore. And uh, negative, or sorry, behaviors that uh, come out of these negative experiences. We, we, again, we heard a little bit about this this morning. So accommodation, what can I do? It's gonna happen, there's nothing I can do about it, so I don't do anything about it. Um, uh, even to the point of why even bring it up to my, to my caregivers, they're not gonna do anything for me. Anticipation, so things like wearing factor, or uh, medical alert bracelets, carrying factor um, first. Uh, information or carrying their factor levels with them in their purse when they go out, 
advocacy, speaking up for themselves, asking for a second opinion, or becoming part of, of conferences like this. Um, avoidance of the healthcare system, we had partial avoidance, so avoiding particular doctors, or complete avoidance, so I just don't go for help for anything anymore, whether it be related to my bleeding or not. Um, some, so those were classic behaviors. Some surprising behaviors that were um, important to talk about. Contributing to a collective experience, kind of what we're doing today. So the, the bleeding disorders community is very tightly knit. It's a very wonderful community. We share stories, we talk together. Um, so this was really important and this really came out that if something happened to one person, it was really felt by the whole group. So those negative experiences felt, you know, instead of it being one, it's now being felt by 10 or 20 people. Um, Self-medicating, so this is a, um, an important one to talk about. Some carriers felt so desperate um, that they had a bleeding disorder that they weren't gonna get help, that they would actually go to a relative to get factor. So for example, this, um, this family uh, told me that if, if the mother would go down to the hospital, she thought she had a bleed, they knew they would hassle her, so it was easier to go to, um, to their son and say, you know, bring me your factor and, and give it to me. Okay. So tying all of these ideas together, um, we envision this model of a negative feedback loop, which is perpetuating the negative experiences of, of the carriers. And, um, the reason that, that this is happening, um, we're suggesting, is these predisposing issues that are predisposing to systematic errors. So, um, so carriers are unaware uh, sometimes of their bleeding disorder, so that's making it uh, more difficult. Also, they don't necessarily seek medical attention for their bleeding disorder, um, I, either because uh, you know, they're a mother caring for a son who's severely affected, and so you know, they don't have time to worry about themselves, or they're, they're just comparing their experiences to their brother or their father, and uh, don't feel that it's as important to bring up because it's uh, potentially less, less severe. Um, we have uh, some uninformed healthcare providers, certainly that are not helping the situation and, and not necessarily listening to their patients. Um, and uh, technical difficulties, a lot of times we're talking about mild hemophilia, not always, but a lot of times mild hemophilia, which can be very difficult to diagnose, and, uh, and that's just making it more difficult. And also the symptoms are non-classic, so, you know, gynecological, obstetrical issues are not necessarily on their list of, of things in their mind that are associated with hemophilia. Okay, so these predisposing issues um, are leading to systematic errors and um, numerous repeated and compounded errors. So if you're not getting a proper diagnosis then you're, and you're not getting um, the proper precautions put in place, then you're more likely to have some kind of issue and then it just perpetuates. Um, and then again, we're feeding these, these negative stories into the collective experience, so all together everyone's hearing about all these horrible things, and we're losing confidence and, and having more mistrust, which leads to close communication, so then less information is going to the healthcare providers, which makes it more difficult for them to do their job. Um, so all of this leads to worsening medical situation. So what we have to do is break the cycle and, uh, and get, get this feedback loop working in our favor, um, so if we have uh, carriers who are aware of their bleeding disorder, we have carriers seeking medical um, attention when they have an issue, informed healthcare system, uh, we have some technical improvements so that we know uh, whether we can predict bleeding accurately, um, and, uh, and improved carrier care policy. So I mean, we've, we've heard a lot about women's bleeding disorders clinics, that kind of thing needs to be, we need more of that. Um, so if we implement these solutions, then we can start having some positive experiences. And then we really need to talk about those positive experiences. It's, it's easier to talk about negative experiences, and, and I saw that in the study. So really, if something good happens to you, we have to talk about that too, so that we get uh, a boost of confidence with the healthcare system and, um, and open the communication and really share. And uh, we all have uh, a role to play in this, um, ourselves as researchers, as well as carriers to participate in researchers, or sorry, participate in research, or, um, or just be more open and advocates for their own health. And the healthcare system um, needs to listen, participate in research, all that kind of thing. So we all need to work together. Um, so we're continuing on with this work. Um, we, so we published the initial interview study and now we're carrying on with a survey study. Um, we have some questionnaires available. Um, otherwise you can come to our website and, and download a survey or get in, in touch with us. 
that we want to find out whether the themes that we've identified in the initial study are applicable to carriers you know, across the country and really get some good numbers. And um, this, the surveys will be available in French. I'm in the middle of, of translations right now. And uh, we're looking for carriers of hemophilia A or B, whether or not you have bleeding symptoms, as well as parents of, uh, of carrier girls, hemophiliac men and non-carrier women. We need you guys as well to, uh, to serve as controls so that we know what's um, specific to our carrier population. And um, I think that's all I had to say. Yeah. So if you have any questions about that, um, I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> Questions? Mary Frances? <clears throat> sorry, I, I have a cold, so sorry. My voice will be very difficult to hear. Um, that was a lovely presentation. And uh, I just wanted to say, in Newfoundland, we've studied, we've a lot of patients with mild hemophilia. And earlier, some of our colleagues in obstetrics were pointed out that bleeding in women is quite common. And I would like to reassure people with, uh, who are carriers for mild hemophilia that we did quite a large study looking at 88 carriers and 65 of their sisters who weren't carriers for a mutation, failing to have any 2016 mutation for mild hemophilia. And we did a very detailed um, study of their bleeding experiences and so on. And what we found was that especially in rural Newfoundland, many women had problems with menstrual bleeding and other bleeding symptoms. And when we first got involved with the community and were taking their stories, we assumed this was because they were carriers. But when we actually studied in that group, there was no difference in the bleeding symptoms between the um, carriers and, the, uh, and their siblings who weren't carriers. And I just think that's an important message because we have a lot of young women who are very worried because they are carriers for mild hemophilia and they're worried about things maybe going wrong. And we were, we're, we're trying to get the message out that there are situations where it is, it is not a problem as well or it's not, yeah. it's not the only problem. There, there could be other issues causing bleeding and we have to take care of that. But yeah, that's, that's a good point actually. It, it brings up uh, one of the things that I found in a study um, with the idea of avoidance. So, um, so one carrier who had sort of dismissed her, her issues for a long time um, with, because she had some severely affected sons was telling me, uh, talking to me about her experiences and that you know, recently she'd had um, major changes in her, in her menstrual period and that all of a sudden become extremely heavy and you know, maybe I should go talk to someone about that. Yes, <laughs> you know, and it may, may or may not be related to your to your carrier status, but sort of the reluctance to worry about herself had carried over again into what may be completely unrelated, but she again was not seeking medical attention. So it it still ties into uh, the interaction of the carriers with the healthcare system. Yeah. I had a couple of questions around the theme of genetic testing for the carrier status. Yes. So obviously now we can remove the uncertainty about whether you are or are not. And I, I mean, I understand in a way what you're saying that the negative experience of getting that information is initially a bad thing, perhaps, or it's a difficult thing. But ultimately, presumably, that can be translated into positive things because you know the status. And then the second question, which is, is underage carrier testing. So as you know, it's very controversial. I'd be interested in your comments about testing young women who are below the age of 18. Yeah. So, um, so first of all, to address the first point, the carrier testing errors that we ran into actually wasn't, um, wasn't what you're thinking of. It was that they weren't tested. <laughs> was there, was there, their error or their negative experience that uh, they didn't find out they were a carrier until after they had an affected son, even with the family history and their own bleeding history. So that's more what I was referring to there that actually hadn't been tested. Yeah. Um, and then as for carrier testing of minors, of course, there, that's, that's very hotly debated. Um, my personal uh, viewpoint of that would be um, to think about separating the idea of carrier testing and, and testing for a bleeding disorder. 
So you might be able to get around that issue if, if you have someone that could potentially be a carrier, maybe, uh, but they're, they're a minor, rather than going straight for the carrier test, you might be able to do a factor level. Then if their factor level is, is normal, hopefully they could then understand with counseling that that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not a carrier. But then if they have low factor, then you're talking about um, a patient. So then that, that's appropriate to know that they, they have a bleeding disorder. So you sort of avoid the carrier <laughs> testing. Yeah. Hi. Very, very interesting study. I just wanted to highlight the, at the end, I think, an important point, which is I think people need to understand about, um, about qualitative research. It's generating, you're generating ideas, you're generating, and I think it's always a bit of a concern that people make the leap to say that, you know, that this, because this is in the stories of the people you interviewed, yeah. it doesn't necessarily apply to all carriers across Canada. Exactly. So I think it's very important what you're doing next yeah. uh, of, of taking that, taking it and surveying and see how much this applies and, and then revising your theories, because I think it's very interesting. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly right. And um, so we not only need to, to identify what are the problems, but then at what level is it a problem? Is it just one person that had a really bad experience, or is this a systematic problem with the, with the whole system that needs to be addressed? Other questions? Any further questions? Uh, I just, one more comment. Yes. Um, so, so I did, uh, so we are again actively recruiting um, carers and, uh, and other people for, for the, um, the survey project. So if you, if you are a carrier or, or part of that community, um, the, the surveys are available or you can contact us. But also if you have access to carers and you, you're interested in maybe helping us recruit some people, I'd be really happy to speak with you about that too. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So we're doing a great job keeping on time, and, and now I'm going to invite Paula up again. She's the star of our conference this, today, um, to, to discuss with us the bleeding scores and, and their development, review where, they, where we've been and where we are now. So thanks. Correct. Thanks, Pat. Hopefully you're not sick of me yet. Um, I, I really could talk about this all day. I could have just been up here myself. So um, I'm happy to be up here again. And I've actually just set my timer. I'm going to watch my time carefully here because I know I'm, I'm the thing between us and being done, though. So, um, OK, so mild bleeding disorders are common. Um, and we've heard a few different prevalence estimates today. Um, they cause significant morbidity, and for the most part, there's no gold standard from a laboratory point of view, and this makes diagnosis really difficult. And the examples of um, von Willebrand's disease or platelet function disorders, I think, are good examples of this issue. There can be a lack of clear inheritance in families because of incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity, and I think that diagnostic strategies, um, as I was trying to stress earlier, need to really focus on the bleeding history. One of the problems, though, is that bleeding histories are pretty subjective, and patients interpret bleeding symptoms differently, and physicians interpret bleeding symptoms differently. And, as I mentioned earlier, all of us bleed or bruise if you hit us or cut us. And so distinguishing what's normal um, in the general population and what's abnormal is critically important. And I think in this field, one of the things that is useful is to have a common language. Um, and so a number of years ago, we got interested in standardized quantitative scores um, for bleeding symptoms. And there really has been an evolution here over time. The bleeding score I showed this morning was this one in the middle. We really based our work on work from Italy, um, from an area called Vicenza. And these investigators really have pioneered a lot of what's been done in recent years. And that original tool has gone through a number of um, modifications, most recently to a consensus bleeding assessment tool that's been published and endorsed by the International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis. But this isn't the only show um, in town, and there are a number of other groups that have done excellent work with um, assessing bleeding symptoms. There are general tools that have been devised, like the bleeding history questionnaire from the Rockefeller University group, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. 
There's a bleeding scale from WHO um, that has been studied in a few different um, patient settings. There are disease-specific tools, um, the CHAT, which has been developed by Kathy Hayward and her group, um, and that work largely evolved out of their um, interest with the Quebec platelet disorder. And then um, menorrhagia-specific tools, um, the PBAC score, which we've heard about, and Claire Phillips has published a screening tool for menorrhagia. And I don't mean to suggest that this is an exhaustive list. Um, I, I'm sure there are others that, that I haven't touched on. I think that one of the things that's really important when you think about this kind of research is what is it that you actually want the tool to do? Um, do you want this to be a screening test or do you want this to assess disease severity or are you hoping that it's going to be able to do both? And both of these areas have been researched. Um, in terms of using it as a screening tool, distinguishing normal from abnormal, looking at uh, primary care patients, patients who've been referred. And then in terms of assessing disease severity, correlating bleeding scores with factor levels, looking at impairment of quality of life, trying to predict the risk of hemorrhage, and this is actually probably where the tools are falling short right now, and then perhaps to help stratify treatment. And so there are a number of studies um, that I've listed on the bottom of the slide here that have addressed the majority of these issues, but there are some problems. Um, most of the tools, um, with the exception of PBAC and CHAT, have to be administered by an expert um, and are not really intended to be self-administered by patients who are wondering about their symptoms. Um, as I've already shown, there are a whole bunch of them. And so this idea that we're standardizing, we still have a ways to go. Um, the other issue in terms of expert derived is that a lot of the work that we've been involved with in um, from the Vicenza based tools doctors and experts decided how to weight bleeding symptoms and so for example they made a decision that having your nose cauterized for a nosebleed was going to get the same score as being iron deficient from menstrual periods and I don't know necessarily that those two things are equal. And so there were some assumptions made early on about how this was going to be scored. And so what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is tell you about three projects um, that are ongoing that try to address some of those limitations. I'm going to start with the Rockefeller study, tell you about a merging project, and then show you some data that we've currently um, got from a study trying to convert the expert administered tools into something that could be administered by a patient. So RUBHQ um, is the bleeding history questionnaire from Barry Collar's group in the States. He has an ontology based um, tool that is available to researchers on the web free of charge. It's extremely comprehensive. It's like the world's worst bleeding score. It takes an hour. Um, and he has not made any predetermined assumptions about how to weight bleeding symptoms. What he's planning on doing is he's already administered this hour-long questionnaire to 500 normals, and that data was published last year in JTH. What he's doing now is collecting bleeders, so individuals with type 1 von Willebrand's disease, and he's planning on um, analyzing the data to compare those two groups. And exactly how he's going to do the analysis to derive the score, I think, is a bit of a work in process. But one of the things I've heard him talk about is using the odds ratio um, of a symptom, and if it can distinguish between affected and unaffected, having that be the bleeding score for that symptom. So actually having the data derive the score, um, I think it's brilliant. It's agonizing. And I shouldn't complain, because I actually don't do this. My research assistant, Julie, is doing this. We're helping him recruit um, patients with type 1 von Willebrand's disease. But this is happening in parallel with all of the other work. And what I'm hoping is that we end up understanding a great deal more than we do um, at the moment because of assumptions that were made a number of years ago. The merging project, um, again, Dr. Collar is involved with myself, Dr. Margaret Rand, and Dr. Victor Blanchette from the Hospital for Sick Children. We're working with Barry's group to try to create a bioinformatics system to merge and analyze data that has been derived from different bleeding questionnaires. Um, we started with the Vicenza-based tools because it's a bit easier to merge when something evolved from a previous version to actually put that data together is a little bit easier. The ultimate goal, though, is to actually merge all of that data with the RUBHQ data. 
And we're hoping that within the next year we end up with a sample size of thousands um, that will actually help us answer some questions about important bleeding symptoms. And also, which are the questions that are critical? Um, so if you have to ask three questions, which are the ones that are the absolute best? Um, that's really what we're aiming for. We've been working to create templates to input the data. Um, and I'm going to talk about this at the Liverpool ISTH SSC. And the templates will be available to anyone who has data and is interested in participating in the project. And so this is where we've started um, with the three most recent. Um, and by Liverpool, we should have analysis on 1,300 uh, individuals from those three tools. Um, and like I said, we're really hoping that by doing this, we'll encourage other people to participate who may have data sitting in a computer somewhere um, that might help us increase the sample size to, to answer some of these important questions. So the last study I'm going to talk about, uh, we call the self-bat study. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this addresses this issue that the bats are expert administered. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but um, it means that for a patient who might be wondering about their symptom, it's not a useful tool for them to self-discover um, if their bleeding is abnormal or normal. When we started this project, we wanted to keep a common language, um, and so it was really important to us that the bleeding scores we got from the self-administered tool were consistent with what we get from an expert administered tool. We didn't want to actually throw another language um, into the pot. Um, we made the decision to start um, with the ISTH bat um, rather than any of the previous versions. It's the most recent and the one endorsed by the society. And we've started the study in adults, um, but there is hopefully plans in the future to extend this into children as well. And so this is the study design that we're following. Um, there's three phases to the study. The first is to generate, pretest, and then optimize the self-administered questionnaire. And I've learned so much from doing this study. I thought that you could just take the questionnaire and turn it into lay language and then give it out. And that actually isn't nearly enough in terms of doing this properly. Um, after we, we're actually done that phase and I'm going to show you the data. After that, our plan is to administer the self-bat to a, an additional group of normals and type 1s to help figure out what the most discriminatory questions are and to get it as short as we can get it. And once we get there, we're planning on prospectively validating it. Um, all of the work I'm showing now is from one of my graduate students, Megan DeForest, uh, who's in the audience. So this is how we did the first part, phase 1. Um, we did start by just turning it into lay language. Um, we took the expert administered ISTH bat and we put it in a grade four um, language, which is what's recommended in literature that's been published about doing this kind of work. Then we recruited patients who were healthy controls and individuals with type one von Willebrand's disease. We picked type one von Willebrand's disease because it's the most common, and locally we have lots of patients. Um, it's also the bleeding disorder that's been the most studied um, with bleeding questionnaires, and that's why we picked that as our affected group. People came in in groups of five to 10, um, and they came in twice. On the first visit, they would get one of the questionnaires. Either they would have the expert questionnaire administered, or they'd get given the self bat and fill it out themselves. And then they came back two weeks later and did the other one. And the order that they did those in was randomized. And so some people would get one the first time, and some would get the other. Um, after they were done the second visit, we ran focus groups. And so we actually asked them, what did you think about the self-administered questionnaire? Were there any questions you didn't understand? Um, do you have any suggestions for us how to improve it? And again, this was a totally new area of research for me, and the focus groups were so much fun. Um, and what happened was in the beginning, we heard the same thing over and over and over again. It was so consistent. It was, it was totally amazing. And once we started addressing those issues and were using subsequent revised versions, the chatter during the focus groups just got quieter and quieter. And so we basically set up a process of cycling this. So having the first version, administering it to a group of normals and a group of type 1s, getting the data, and then doing um, a summary of the kind of feedback we were getting, and also doing some analysis, um, the interclass correlation coefficient, to see how well the scores matched from one versus the other. Then we, would, then we generated the second version, and we started again. And so we took the second version, administered that, 
two weeks apart from the expert version, and we kept going until the focus group feedback got quiet and we got a correlation of greater than 80. And that's what's out there in the literature in terms of um, being published as a reasonable correlation. Um, and so we did that um, three times and ended up with a fourth version of the questionnaire. Um, and so to give you an example of the kind of changes that we made as we were going through this process, when we were asking um, questions about the bleeding symptoms, the way we worded it originally was, have you ever had a problem with nosebleeds? Everybody hated that. They did not want to be responsible for deciding if their symptom was a problem or not. The amount of discomfort that that word created was actually significant. And so we decided, okay, well, we actually won't have any kind of a judgment we're just going to collect data about the symptoms. And this is because that's how the expert questionnaire works. But what happens if you're actually administering the expert questionnaire is you say, have you ever had a problem with nosebleeds? And the patient says, what do you mean by problem? And you define it. And so in the absence of that, we had to actually get rid of that word. And so as an example of the kind of modification we did, we just said, have you ever had nosebleeds? Um, and you'd be surprised. Some people actually say no. Um, but many people say yes, and then they go on to give us all of the details about those nosebleeds, and that's how we figure out what the bleeding score is. So if you take a look at the whole population, the ICCs started out lower than 0.8, and as we went through the study, they started increasing. This is the data on everyone, um, and it was certainly significantly affected and improved by subjects who came into the study later. We had about 40 controls and about 20 type 1. So this is about 60 people who've been through the study so far. And you can see that I've got the score from the expert administered ISTH bat and the self bat, and the correlation is, is quite nice. It's a little bit looser for the bleeders, um, a little bit tighter for the controls, but overall we were happy with um, the correlation and called the version 4 the end of phase 1. And so where we're at now is phase two, which is item reduction. And so we are planning on administering just the self bat now, so people only have to come in once, um, to normals and individuals with type one. And then we're planning on doing a set of analyses that will help us figure out which questions are the most sensitive. We're gonna do rock curve analysis, which helps you figure out how well does this item tell the difference between normal and abnormal. Um, we're planning, we think we're going to need somewhere in this kind of sample size. We're not certain about that and we're going to have to analyze as we go. Right now we've got nine normals and seven type ones. And once we finish this part and end up with the shortest questionnaire that we can come up with, then we're going to prospectively test it um, as a screening tool for patients who have symptoms of excessive bru bruising or bleeding. And I am really hopeful that once we do that, we actually will have a tool that we can put up on the web and that can be accessible to patients to try to get at some of what we've been talking about today, which is how do people figure out if their bleeding symptoms are normal or abnormal if nobody talks about it? Um, I would love if this could be widely accessible, and I've had some really good conversations with um, a, a representative from the World Federation today already about some of this, because I think all of these will help address the undiagnosed affected patient. So, um, all of the current research that we're involved with and many others in this room are involved with, I think we're trying to address the limitations of the current tools and improve and optimize them. Um, and I think we need to continue doing that work and to validate um, all of these tools for clinical outcomes. My ultimate vision for this um, is that we have a web-based tool, you can log on, and you can tell the system, I'm a physician, I'm a hematologist, I'm an ENT surgeon, I'm a patient, and the right tool that's been validated pops up and it's as short as possible. And you can go in and fill out that information and get some kind of a read about bleeding symptoms, whether they're normal, abnormal, whether you should seek medical attention. For an ENT surgeon, does that mean a referral to hematology? Um, I think that some of this could be site specific, like I said, um, validating it in different clinical settings. And also, I am keen on the idea of organ specific, so tools that have been really 
tweaked and perfected for menorrhagia versus tools that have been tweaked and perfected for nosebleeds in children because they're probably not going to be the same tools. So I want to acknowledge the collaborators who've worked with me on all of these projects from Kingston and from Toronto. Um, I want to acknowledge our collaborators from Rockefeller University who've been lots of fun and dedicated to this and give me an excuse to go to New York a lot. Um, I want to acknowledge CSL Baring who's funding the self bat study and CHS again who's funded much of the other work that we've done. And my last slide. Uh, so this is the first time that my group had gotten big enough that we could take a picture separate from David's group. <laughs> and you can see everybody got really excited and got dressed up. Um, but there's three people who deserve special mention from this group. The entire group is fabulous, but Mackenzie Bowman, um, who actually is a PhD student with David and I now, her dedication to the early work that we did with bleeding scores actually made this a viable academic pursuit for our entire group. And really a lot of what we've done rests on the success and the, her dedication. Um, I want to acknowledge Megan DeForest. Uh, so Megan is the grad student um, who's working on the South Bat study. And Megan started in May and really just took off running um, with this study and has done a fabulous job. And the last person I want to acknowledge is Julie Grable, who's my research assistant. And honest to God, this woman never flinches when I say, hey, we're going to sign up for another bleeding score study, um, and really does a great job. And so I, I really want to acknowledge my team and also thank you for your attention. So I think given that we started a little late, we have time for a few questions. And we will be done before 5. Yes. Congratulations, uh, Paul, on this uh, work. And um, I'm, I don't think I forgot to uh, congratulate you for your NHF award. That was very well uh, received, you and David. Cause yeah. No, and thank you for that, Peter. And we should acknowledge that David and I actually received that award together. So thanks for that. Yes. And um, two questions I had was, um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, off study, when you see a patient, um, I assume, are you using uh, what uh, we use off study, uh, the Kingston, where we like the idea of the negative part, and I yeah. still don't understand. I've read the paper, you know, in, uh, in JTH, I've talked to others and you about why exactly was the negative uh, taken out? Um, yeah, in my clinic, I still use the negative. Okay, thank you. I feel better then <laughs> that I'm doing that. Is there any uh, uh, possibility that it could be reincorporated as so, opposed to just, it seems some of our colleagues have really taken to, this is what you have to use, the BAT that was sanctioned by ISTH. Yep, so I mean, uh, Peter Gerbs absolutely right. The discussions about which score was going to be the one that went into the ISTH bat were very heated. Um, and there were firmly held fixed beliefs in both camps that the minus was useful and that the minus wasn't useful. We've taken a look at some of our data and it turns out that, that the answer about whether it's useful or not is variable depending on what you're using it for. Um, and so the concession that was made was that the tool, the ISTH bat, you can actually calculate the score either way. And the hope, I think, is when we get enough data together, we can actually answer that definitively with a large sample size, which one's better. And then Kingston, do you use the other category for the pediatric or? Yes. You do? Yeah. It, and then um, in terms of uh, in those patients who uh, have a high score but uh, do not have a hemostatic defect, what are you doing in studying those patients? Or as a practical issue, are you considering semi-empiric uh, hemostatic therapy for those patients when they have to undergo surgery? Yeah. Um, so yes, we actually continue to follow those patients. And we have had a number of those patients go through invasive procedures, and we address it in the general hemostatic way, just like you said. So. Tranexamic acid, desmopressin, which there is evidence for use outside of von Willebrand's disease, platelet function disorders. Um, we've had good experience, so it's the kind of thing you shouldn't say out loud, but so far we actually haven't had any bleeding complications in those patients that we've managed that way. And many of these are patients who had bad bleeding with procedures before. To answer what we're doing about it, we actually are doing a genetic study, and so we're getting DNA on all of them. And Shannon Jackson and Manchu Poon are collaborating with us on this. Um, when I wrote the grant, I wrote it as a GWAS. It's probably not going to be the right approach anymore. It may be an exome sequencing approach. I don't quite know, and we've got about a year left. So when we get a few hundred, we're going to do something to try to identify genetically where do we need to look that we haven't thought of yet. 
Hi, Paula. It, it's, Hi, it, I, I love hearing you talk because every if, I hear I hear you talk every year, and always there's new stuff you're doing. It's fantastic. Um, what I'm really interested in is that you're talking about an item reduction phase on on what you're doing, and I'm just one of the things is I don't know how the heck you're going to do. I guess one of the questions is. What is this tool, this self bat, going to be used for? And as yeah. you say, it could be used in so many different settings. And I'm just a little concerned when you item reduce it, you might take out useful items that might be useful, in per, you know, in particular, depending on the setting. I guess. Yeah, that's a great point, Rob. And I, that's a fabulous point, actually, and one that we hadn't thought about in terms of study design. We'll chat about it as soon as we're done here. It, it's a really <laughs> important point because you're right, actually. I mean, when I'm just a, comparing effectives and controls, I might take something out that if you're screening would be really useful. So thanks. Rob knows a lot about how to do this, so thanks, Rob. I want to thank Dr. McCusker for uh, <coughs> mediating the research uh, part of uh, the research panel of today. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's for you. Okay. So um, this almost concludes um, Code Rouge 2012, so the first uh, meeting, national meeting on women in bleeding disorders. It's been a real honor for me to have been named as honorary chair of Code Rouge. I can't tell you how humbling the experience has been uh, to be here in the shoes that I've been put in um, as both a physician, a person uh, who cares a lot about this and about women with bleeding disorders. Um, I've been really blessed to have been put in a platform uh, and in a group of uh, family with the CHS uh, that will allow us all today to push forward this cause for the future. I want to thank uh, especially the, uh, the speakers today, uh, also for your presence. The room is full today. That's very impressive. I think that we've had some, a little over 240, a little over 240, you told me yesterday, uh, people here. So that's very something to be very proud of. And of course, uh, I'd like to thank the ambassadors for being courageous and brave enough to share those stories. I know it was very emotional. And uh, this is all about you. And this is all about you getting the word out uh, for the future and uh, us helping you make sure that women in the future get the care that uh, they deserve and need. Um, and last but not least, I want to thank the Canadian Hemophilia Society. Um, without them, this whole event and this whole uh, launching of Code Rouge would have not been possible. And especially with, the, with Chantal Raymond and the persistence and tireless effort of Claire uh, Kajini from the Canadian Hemophilia Society, without whom this event would have never taken place. I also want to thank Pam for hosting and for mediating a large part of today. And um, it's about all of you that this is all about today. I'm just passing on the message, and uh, I'm very grateful for giving us the opportunity today to work with all of you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to make it very short and sweet. So uh, I'd like to thank all of you for participating uh, today. A really great event. Uh, I applaud all of your commitment to improving the life uh, and the, the of women with inherited bleeding disorders. <clears throat> and uh, finally, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, CSL Bering, and our participating sponsors for making this conference possible.